as they look to emulate English intellectuals like Joseph Addison and Richard Steele and bring philosophy down from the heavens and into the coffee houses of Edinburgh and Glasgow, their discourse constantly reflected on interpenetrations of polity and economy and the implications of those interpenetrations for civil society. Welcome to the Acton Vault podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. Today's episode takes us back to September 8th, 2022, and our 2022 Callahan Lecture from Novak Award winner Eric Matson, delivered at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dr. Matson's lecture explores how, in the British tradition, political economy, which partly emerged out of discourses in natural theology, ethics, and jurisprudence, casts some light on the content of our moral obligations. Drawing on Hutchison, Hume, and Smith, he discusses how commerce in the 18th century came to be depicted as a mode of cooperation, either literally with God or metaphorically with our fellow human beings, through which we serve the common good. That depiction energized the emerging authorization of commercial enterprise, helping to illustrate the virtue of what Deirdre McCloskey calls the bourgeois virtues. The depiction continues to edify business as a calling and elaborates how freedom serves the good of humankind. Eric W. Matson is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center and the deputy director of the Adam Smith Program at George Mason University's Department of Economics. He serves as an online course lecturer at the King's College, New York. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at New York University. He earned a PhD in economics from George Mason University in 2017. To learn more about the Callahan Lecture and the Novak Award, please visit the links in the show notes for this episode. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Good evening. My name is Chris Mowron, and I'm the president of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening on behalf of my organization to the annual presentation of the Novak Award and the Callahan Lecture. But first, let me acknowledge my gratitude to the Mercatus Center for hosting us this evening, and a special thank you to, to Dan and Virgil and your team for all the work your, your colleagues put into helping us be well received here this evening. In Grand Rapids, we look with envy at the great work being done here at Mercatus, a true exemplar of freedom-directed scholarship uh, and terrific, excellent intellectual formation. So we're grateful to be here in partnership with you this evening, and we hope it's not uh, the last time we do so. Acton was founded in 1990 to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. In 1990, no one better epitomized the research and writing at this intersection than Michael Novak. So not surprisingly, we persuaded Michael to be part of our great adventure, which he happily was uh, from our early days in 1990. A few years later, I met Joseph Callahan, a successful entrepreneur in Pittsburgh, who himself had been, uh, been um, inspired after reading The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism and other Novak books uh, to be a, a great advocate of Michael's work. And in some early conversations, we commiserated about the need to encourage more scholarship at the intersection of Michael's ideas of free enterprise and morality. And hence the idea of encouraging Young Scholars through a Novak Award was born. We launched that program in the year 2000 at our 10th anniversary. And this year, tonight, we're uh, bestowing the 22nd uh, Novak Award Laureate. Uh, so since 2000, uh, young leaders have been selected from around the world. They've, they have hailed from Argentina, 
Argent, uh, Australia, Portugal, France, Singapore, Finland, Germany, Lithuania, and Poland, not to mention a number from the United States. I know there are three winners, past winners in the room tonight, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize them and have you join me in doing so. In 1990, in, I'm sorry, in 2004, our laureate was Max Torres. <clears throat> In 2009, Andrew Abella. And in 2015, Catherine Pakalik. And tonight, this distinguished group will be joined by our 2022 winner, Dr. Eric W. Matson. Now, Dr. Matson is known to you here. He's a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center and Deputy Director of the Adam Smith Program at George Mason's Department of Economics. He also serves as an online course lecturer at the King's College in New York. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at NYU. He earned his PhD here at George Mason University in 2017. He's published widely on Adam Smith, David Hume, and economic philosophy. Uh, upcoming, he has a collection of essays on welfare and the philosophy of behavioral paternalism, which will soon be published by the IEA. He and Dr. Jordan Baller are also producing a multi-volume project on the history of Christian economic thought. As an economist, uh, Dr. Matson well knows that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So in order for him to earn his lunch this evening and the 2022 award, he must first deliver the Callahan Lecture. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Matson. Thanks for that introduction, Chris. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all here tonight. And thank you so much for choosing to spend part of your, uh, your evening with us. I'm truly honored to receive this year's Novak Award and to have three previous Novak Award winners here in the audience. I'd like to convey my gratitude to the Acton Institute for their kind recognition and for their vote of confidence in my work. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the Mercatus Center for generously hosting the event this evening and for their continued support of my work and the work that Dan Klein and I are doing in the Adam Smith program. We're deeply grateful. Let me also say thank you to Sarah Negri at the Acton Institute and to Carla Segovia at Mercatus for coordinating tonight's lecture and working behind the scenes to make sure uh, the snacks are here, the drinks are in place, and everyone has name tags, so thank you both. So my research for the past few years has dealt especially with three Scottish philosophers, Francis Hutcheson, David Hume, and Adam Smith. I've been working with these thinkers to try to better understand the place of economics within a broad moral enterprise. And I've worked in my research up to the idea of political economy in Scotland as an outgrowth of natural theology and as an expression of ethics, hence the title of my talk this evening, Economics and the Moral Theology of Mutual Benefits. So why are these Scots interesting? Well, the 18th century Scots provide us with a useful way to explore and develop the common intuition that economics is actually about much more than economics. The chief subject matter of economics is material. It concerns the production and the exchange and the distribution and the consumption of goods and services. But as we examine the conditions that facilitate production, and that enable exchange and that afford a widespread distribution of material benefits, we look to economics, cultural and ethical dimensions. Hume and Smith's Irish contemporary, Edmund Burke, wrote that commerce and trade themselves are but effects of certain social practices and values. Now, the ethical and cultural dimensions of economics are brought into further relief as we consider the behavioral effects of robust and extensive markets. Not only does commerce depend on certain cultural elements and social sensibilities, but it gives rise to new social practices and encourages certain forms of conduct. 
The Scots, these Scots in particular, were writing as Britain was transitioning from an agrarian economy into a bustling industrial nation. So they were keenly aware of the cultural and ethical aspects of economics. Their distinctive Scottish perspective enhanced that awareness. In the first decades of the 18th century, Scotland was desperately poor, industry was stagnant, profitless, and people were hungry. In the first decades of the 18th century, Edinburgh and Glasgow were backwards towns compared to most English cities. At the turn of the century, after an ill-conceived attempt to start a colony in Panama, Scotland was in shambles, the Scottish economy at any rate. Even as the cities began to develop in the 1720s and 30s, the Scots could still, within a few days' journey, encounter communities at all different stages of economic development. There's a quote, it's, it's a great quote, I think it's true, from a historian who says that while Hutchison was lecturing on Locke and Shaftesbury in Glasgow, carts were unknown 12 miles away. So this social and historical and economic context in Scotland inclined Hutchison, Hume, and Smith to philosophize against the backdrop of political economy. As they looked to emulate English intellectuals like Joseph Addison and Richard Steele and bring philosophy down from the heavens and into the coffee houses of Edinburgh and Glasgow, their discourse constantly reflected on interpenetrations of polity and economy and the implications of those interpenetrations for civil society. The historian John Robertson writes that the Enlightenment in Scotland was dedicated to understanding and publicizing the causes of human betterment on this earth, and that the terms in which this objective was articulated were increasingly those of political economy. Especially in Hume and Smith, but also to some extent in Hutchison, moral philosophy gravitates towards economics partly to aid discussions in public policy. Hume, for instance, understood that proper deliberations concerning money and concerning international trade and national prosperity very often run against our natural intuitions and our natural policy inclinations. So Hume looked to correct our protectionist and collectivist instincts by elucidating in a series of popular essays what he called the logic of an indissoluble chain of liberty, sorry, industry, knowledge, and humanity. He teaches that freedom and security enable commerce. Commerce enlivens the human spirit, which rouses men and women from indolence and inspires them to aspire and to create and to engage in mutually beneficial activities. Hume believed that an industrious mindset spills over into other aspects of culture, facilitating scientific, legal, and artistic advancement. These advancements bring people into contact with one another, leading to urbanization and socialization, which Hume believes fosters moral improvement. Restrictive economic policies, including price controls, tariffs, and subsidies, he concludes, harm the polity and its citizens on the whole. Building on Hume, Adam Smith's analysis culminates in the wealth of nations in his recommendation of what he calls the generous and liberal plan which he says allows every man to pursue his own interest, his own way. His liberal plan derives moral authorization from, among other things, his reflection on the widespread benefits of an extended division of labor, the coordinating powers of the market process, and also the limitations of human knowledge. I'll also mention, because it's often forgotten, that as Smith follows Hume, so too does he follow his, his teacher, the never-to-be-forgotten Francis Hutcheson, Hutchison's students frequently remarked on his passion for liberty and virtue, and Hutchison viewed his job as an educator and a lecturer to exhort his students to moral living and to active citizenship and to the promotion of freedom. In his writings, he laments schemes to do away with property and to meddle in family affairs, and he promotes the virtues of industry, exchange, and limited government. So the role of economics in informing policy is, is widely acknowledged. It's something that we focus on a lot at the Mercatus Center. It's an important ethical aspect of economics, at least in part because of its policy implications. There's a case to be made that political economy has, since the 19th century, displaced Christianity in the West as the dominant mode of discourse about the common good. 
What I've recently come to focus on in my research, however, and what I'll spend some time discussing here tonight, is a different ethical aspect of economics. And this aspect is the relation between the science of economics and our ideas about virtue and moral obligation. So in the tradition of British political economy, economics grew out of moral philosophy and natural theology. What I'd like to suggest to you tonight is that as it unfolds in that tradition, an aspect of economics returns home to rest in ethics and moral theology by casting some light on the practical content of virtue. Economic philosophy in the hands of these Scots, in the hands of Hutchison and Hume and Smith and others, teaches us what sorts of public policies serve the good of the whole, what serves the good of humankind. But it also informs us of the daily habits and practices we ought to adopt and approve of in service to the good of humankind to a large extent. Economics illustrates how one can do good by doing well and why striving to do well for oneself and one's familiars can be laudable. It elucidates the virtue of what the economic historian Deirdre McCloskey calls the bourgeois virtues, and it morally valorizes what Charles Taylor has called the affirmation of ordinary life. Economics illustrates how we can meaningfully cooperate with one another in a metaphorical sense, in a grand social enterprise, as we diligently focus on our ordinary duties and tend to our specific spheres of influence. In theological terms used by Hutchison and Smith, the science of economics illustrates how production, exchange, and the pursuit of honest income can be seen as a kind of cooperation with God in providing for humankind. So the science of economics in the hands of these Scots thus edifies business as a calling that serves the good of the individual and society in which he or she resides. So economics, in other words, can be construed as contributing to a moral theology of mutual benefits. So to draw this interpretation out of ideas in Hutchison and Hume and Smith, let me just begin with a few comments on their notions of virtue and moral obligation. There are differences between their ethical theories, but all three of these thinkers agree that virtue relates to that which serves the good of humankind. In his early work, Hutchison famously proclaims, he's got this famous statement that that action is best which procures the greatest happiness for the greatest numbers. He qualifies this later in his mature writings. He says, the ultimate notion of right is that which tends to the universal good. And for Hume, similarly, right conduct amounts to that which one would approve of uh, from a certain general point of view is useful and agreeable. And building from Hutchison and Hume, Smith formulates right conduct as that which receives moral approbation from an impartial spectator. There are some scholars who go to length to distance Smith's ethics in particular from consequentialism and from Hume in particular. And it is true that Smith emphasizes duty and empathy in his ethics. And it's useful to mind his differences with Hume and also with Hutchison but nonetheless, even for Smith, moral approval is never more than one or two steps away from considerations uh, of the good of humankind. The first ground of moral approval in Smith is the approval of the impartial spectator, the supposed impartial spectator. But on reflection, we realize when we think about the moral authority of the impartial spectator, we realize that the impartial spectator in its highest sense approves only of that which serves the good of humankind. So we do right in the eyes of the impartial spectator when our actions accord with standards of properness and sentiments of merit and social rules. But these touchstones of moral approval derive their authority in the final analysis from their correspondence to that which, which serves the good of humankind. It's not clear, Smith claims, what else a benevolent beholder of humankind, a godlike figure, would in fact approve of. The Smith scholar Ryan Hanley captures this insight well. He says that for Smith, the end of our goodness isn't simply our own happiness, but the promotion of the happiness of all and thereby God's will here on earth. It's a fairly accurate reflection of Smith's position. So defining virtue in this way, in a way that relates to the good of the whole, 
of course, leaves the practical content of our moral obligations dramatically underdetermined. The definition shapes our ethical discourse, but it doesn't tell us much at all about the concrete actions and character traits that actually serve the good. It doesn't tell us how to beneficially steward our material and emotional and mental resources in our daily affairs. It doesn't answer the question of how to effectively advance the interest of society, which is an increasingly difficult question in an integrated order of international finance, transcontinental trade, urbanization, and today in the 21st century, the World Wide Web. The scholar and economic historian R.H. Tawney put this issue into Christian terms in his book, uh, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, which was published 100 years ago this year. Tawney writes, granted that I should love my neighbor as myself, the questions which, under modern conditions of large-scale organization, remain for solution are, who precisely is my neighbor, and how exactly am I to make my love for him effective in practice? And Tawney goes on to claim that medieval religious teachings supplied no answers to these questions, for it had not even realized that they could be put. Now, his claim about medieval religious teachings here is probably doubtful. But regardless, by the 16th century, in the wake of the Renaissance and then the Reformation, a good many theologians turned to reflect on this issue directly. They turned to reflect on the issue of neighborly love in the face of economic and social development. And one of these thinkers was Martin Luther. So Luther expended considerable energy developing a doctrine of vocation. Luther wrote of how God in his providence uses men and women in their ordinary stations of work and parenthood and marriage and government to serve their neighbors. As the soul moves up towards God by faith, which alone secures one's salvation for Luther, it's simultaneously commissioned outwards in love for one's neighbor. God providently sustains the world, but each person can participate in that sustaining work by faithfully pursuing his or her vocation or calling. So through, the work, uh, through his work in man's offices, one Luther scholar says, God's creative work goes forward, and that creative work is love, a profusion of good gifts. Luther himself describes aspects of vocation in this way in his 1532 commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. Luther writes, if you are a craftsman, you will find the Bible placed in your workshop, in your hands, in your heart. It teaches and preaches how you ought to treat your neighbor. Only look to your tools, your needle, your thimble, your beer barrel, your articles of trade, your scales, your measures. You will find this saying written on them. My dear, use me toward your neighbor as you would want him to act toward you with that which is his. Now, if you read Luther, you'll immediately think about Luther's antipathy towards merchants and tradesmen, and especially those working in finance. And it's true. He did demonstrate this kind of hostile attitude towards aspects of commerce and commercial life. But nonetheless, his doctrine of vocation illustrated and helped popularize the idea in Western Europe in the 16th century that in faithfulness and diligence to our ordinary tasks, we cooperate with God's purposes. In dedicating ourselves to our allotted earthly callings, we love our neighbor. In England in the 17th century, Puritan theologians took the idea of vocation or calling from Luther, and probably even more so from Calvin, and increasingly applied it to activities of trade and money-making. One of these thinkers was named William Perkins. At the turn of the century, he wrote a work called A Treatise on Vocations, which did much to continue the spiritualization of ordinary trades. Later on in the century, in 1682, Richard Baxter, whom Max Weber would later identify as exemplifying the Protestant work ethic, argues in a work called How to Do Good to the Many, that through God's providence, each serves the good of others, even as she acts to honestly meet her own needs. Two years after Baxter, another Puritan named Richard Steele penned a work called The Tradesman's Calling. I couldn't find a picture of Steele. He's not super popular online, but that's a shot of his work, The Tradesman's Calling. But in The Tradesman's Calling, Steele lays out a guide for what he calls honest-minded tradesmen. So the tract is notable in a number of ways. It's notable 
in his treatment of commercial enterprise is a laudable activity, which can be pursued for the glory of God and the good of one's neighbor. But beyond that, the work is significant in its treatment of profit-seeking and in its qualified authorization of the pursuit of riches. Steele argues that proper profit margins are largely to be, to be determined by, by conscience, not by external authority. And man, Steele argues, may aim at riches so long as he puts them to constructive use. Now let me return to Tawny for a minute. Tawny makes a very cynical remark in his book that for Steele, trade itself becomes a kind of religion. This assertion echoes something that the English bishop William Warburton said in the 18th century about Josiah Tucker. He said that Tucker made a religion of trade and a trade of religion. Now, these, these comments, they brush up against something important, but their conclusions, I think, are skewed. So for Steele and then for Josiah Tucker, trade does not become a religion, but they recognize, they understand that various analysis of trade should inform the practical teachings of religion. These analyses inform us of the workings of the world, and many of the English believed of the nature and the extent of God's providence. The 17th century English, soon to be followed in the 18th century by the Scots, knew that filling in the content of our practical moral obligation calls for theological reflection. But they also came to see that theology requires economics to help us understand our limitations and to see the concrete actions and policies that serve desired ends. In God's providential economy, Richard Steele, in A Tradesman's Calling, says, Every pin and nail in the building contributes to the beauty and the strength of the whole work. In the 18th century, the science of political economy would make steps in describing, in terms available both to theists and non-theists alike, how that could potentially be possible in the human economy. And the successfulness of that description perhaps further animated the gradual moral authorization and encouragement of commerce that began in the 16th century and that contributed to the great enrichment and the rise of the modern world. Now let's return to Hutchison and Hume and Smith and briefly consider how these themes play out in their ideas. Again, in all three thinkers, we see economics flow out of a broader treatment of ethics and jurisprudence. In Hutchison and Smith, ethics, economics, and jurisprudence are situated within a wider framework of natural theology. When they taught their courses, they taught moral philosophy. The first part of their moral philosophy course was uh, in natural theology, lectures in natural theology which pertains to a study of God and the created order through sense and reason as opposed to special revelation. Now, their authorization of diligent, prudent commerce and their presumptions for economic freedom stem in part from ideas about how God uses the division of labor and the market process to reconcile the good of the individual and the good of the whole of society. For Hutchison and Smith, we may often be said to further ends that a benevolent God would approve of as we diligently take part in the ordinary business of production, exchange, and money-making. Now, some of you might be wondering if this story is applicable to David Hume, the famed infidel of Edinburgh. Now, Hume also looks to encourage commercial virtues and liberal policy reform on his estimation of the widespread benefits that would follow. It's a stretch to say that Hume perceived honest commerce as a mode of cooperation with the deity, but he certainly viewed commerce, property, and stable political authority both as instances of literal cooperation in some circumstances between interacting individuals and metaphorical cooperation between strangers across societies. I'll return to Hume in a moment, but because of his influence on Smith and his self-perception as a public philosopher, devoted to improving the good of humankind, I do think it, in fact, is appropriate to include him in this narrative. Let me first say more about Francis Hutchison. So those of you who are familiar with Adam Smith's ideas and their historical reception will be familiar with the so-called Adam Smith problem, which essentially maintains that Smith's two published works, The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations, rest upon incompatible accounts of human nature. 
Now, one scholar in recent decades has made this same claim about Francis Hutcheson, about a disparity between Hutcheson's early work from the 1720s and his later work uh, in the 1730s and also in the later 1720s. So his early works are on aesthetics and moral psychology and ethics, and his later works tend more towards jurisprudence and political economy. And so the perceived tension lies between Hutcheson's insistence in his early works on our benevolent instincts and his adherence in jurisprudence to a system that parallels those built on assumptions of human selfishness. But as with Smith, I think this tension largely dissolves on closer inspection. Hutchison claims that we discern right conduct through the operation of a special kind of sense that we have. He calls it the moral sense. He's clear, however, that the moral sense requires education. We're not born fit for moral judgment, just as we're not born immediately discerning three-dimensional shapes. So our senses require education. Moral judgment about what serves the good of the whole, Hutchison argues, is complicated, and in many cases it's not intuitive. Given that our judgment requires education, we must, as one scholar usefully puts the point, we must reckon with the possibility that actions which we do not perceive to be morally relevant by the moral sense, nevertheless have a moral aspect by being part of God's intention. That is, they serve the common good. Along these lines, Hutchison remarks at one point that actions materially good might even flow from motives void of all virtue. That is, actions flowing from less than virtuous motives might serve beneficial outcomes. Now, it could, of course, be the case that these outcomes are just luck, just a matter of luck. But Hutchison believes this could also indicate something about the natural order of the world. The study of jurisprudence and political economy in Hutchison help us unearth socially beneficial rules and modes of conduct. Jurisprudence and political economy inform us of the rules or dictates of right reason by which every part of life is to be regulated so as to serve our own good and the good of those around us. For Hutchison, in other words, jurisprudence and political economy subserve ethics. They subserve ethics by guiding our natural moral faculties towards proper objects of approval and towards proper modes of conduct. So two focal points in Hutchison's discourses are private ownership and the division of labor. And these, I think, are central in his account. Without property rights, he argues, we would have virtually no incentive to industry. And this is not because we only care about ourselves, but because our benevolence, like gravity, declines with effective distance. So Hutchison says that we're most concerned with the good of our family and friends, followed by our community and nation. And this ordering of affections in Hutchison is providential because we don't actually have the knowledge or ability to claim for those we do not know, typically, at least in any direct fashion. Property rights in Hutchison give us confidence that our efforts will secure prosperity for those we care for and for those we can, in fact, effectively care for. And they therefore spur industriousness, which channeled through the division of labor enables specialization and increases the dexterity of workers and innovativeness, as Smith would later argue. Through the division of labor in Hutchison, each cooperates with others metaphorically to produce a breathtaking number of goods and services. And Hutchison frames this, he frames both property and by extension the division of labor as part of the moral government of the deity. So the division of labor and property in Hutchison are aspects of God's providential design that integrate our efforts into a broader beneficial whole. And in elaborating them as such, Hutchison enlightens our understanding of our workaday activities as contributing to the divine ordering of society. Complementing his jurisprudential and economic analysis, he encourages us, he exhorts his students to local duties, to diligent commerce, to the stewardship of resources. Hutchison speaks warmly of activity, patience of labor, sagacity, and spirit in business. He dignifies, quote, penetrating genius, capacity for business, patience and application of labor, a tenacious memory, a quick wit. 
He affirms the common lot of honest labor and industry, innocent industry, and the joyful innocent employments of the bulk of mankind. He even smiles upon honest profit, quote, since he who profits one part without hurting any other plainly profits the whole. Let's turn now to David Hume. Hume, of course, does not frame his economic reasonings in theological terms. His critical reflections on natural theology and other forms of theological argument in his dialogues concerning natural religion, combined with his general hostility towards revealed religion in his time, admittedly make it somewhat awkward to draw on his ideas to make a case for economics as moral theology. But I don't actually think it's inappropriate, despite some awkwardness. So recall that Hume's ethics maintain a correspondence between right action and what is useful and agreeable from a general point of view. So if we, like some moderate clergymen in 18th century Scotland, identify God as approving of that which best promotes human happiness and as epitomizing a general and knowledgeable point of view, we easily perceive broad parallels between Hume's account and Hutcheson's, I think. Right conduct for Hume in the final analysis is conduct that serves the good of the whole. It's conduct that's useful and agreeable to the relevant community. And Hume understood, perhaps better than anyone in his day, the vital connection between commerce and the good of humankind. Hume knew the importance of establishing a credible science of economics for elaborating and persuading his peers of that connection. Hume knew that commerce decays not only where it's not secure, but where it's not honorable. He went to great lengths throughout his work to improve his contemporaries' estimation of commercial activity, especially the virtues of merchants, a very unpopular class in the 18th century, even for Adam Smith. Hume saw the rules of property operative in society as an emergent set of mutually beneficial conventions. These conventions guide our interest in a constructive manner such that we contribute to the good of others, even as we focus on ourselves. From property then, Hume goes on to highlight the beneficial nature of domestic and international commerce with the goal of encouraging nations to cease with their warlike tendencies and to move towards freer trade. Hume, the arch skeptic, not only as a man, but as a British subject, tells his readers that he prays for the flourishing commerce of Germany, Spain, Italy, and even France itself. <laughs> and as much as any 18th century Calvinist, Hume exhorts his readers to ward off indolence and to strive towards industry, which is a habit that he claims invigorates the soul and serves the good of the community. In his dialogues, Hume, through the voice of Philo, claims that industry is a power the most valuable of any. He says if he could increase one human trait, it would be industry. Now, because of Hume's skepticism and his alleged materialism, an apparent demarcation between oughts and ises, this point is often missed, but economics for Hume was absolutely a part of a broader normative project. Hume, at heart, was a civic moralist, he sought to enliven public discourse by advancing what he called the science of man. He worked to make the world a more peaceful, virtuous, and prosperous place. The late historian Nicholas Philipson describes Hume in this way. Philipson writes, no one was more concerned with the moral well-being of his contemporaries. No one was more sensitive to the language of contemporary morals and politics. No one did more to develop a language of civic morality that would help his contemporaries understand themselves and the principles on which modern society was organized, and by doing so, help them to live happier, more virtuous lives. Finally, let's turn to the sage of Glasgow, Adam Smith himself. Now, Smith continues in the vein of his teacher Hutchison and his friend Hume. His younger contemporary, Dugald Stewart, wrote in, in a biography of Smith that Smith's ruling passion was a desire to contribute to the happiness and improvement of society. Smith, of course, aims to develop the science of economics to affect policy reform. The wealth of nations is in large part a tract, a critique of the mercantile system. Smith uses economic arguments to advocate for free choice in occupation, free trade in land, 
free domestic trade, free international trade, among other things. But it also is indicated by its title, a treatise on the nature and the causes of wealth in human society. Now, as a treatise, the wealth of nations has been portrayed both as a work of natural theology in the vein of Isaac Newton, and also the inauguration of an atheistic science that we now call economics. This is a live debate. But regardless of what one thinks of Smith's theology, a core message of the wealth of nations that's available to the theist and non-theist alike is that modern commercial society represents a marked improvement in human affairs on account of the miseries it removes from the lives of the many and the increasingly bountiful supplies of goods and services it generates. Or more properly, the bountiful supply that we generate together as we truck, barter, and exchange and prudently work to better our condition. The Wealth of Nations is a very long book. It's about a thousand pages in its present form. But a core message can be discerned in the opening chapters of the work, which despite a lack um, of overt theological language are replete with what we might consider universalist overtones. So in the opening chapter, Smith intimates, as Jeremy Bentham would later describe his work in 1843, how individuals and nations are associates and not rivals in the grand social enterprise. Smith teaches how through the division of labor, universal opulence extends itself to the lowest ranks of people. In sketching the elaborate network of exchange that underpins the production of this mundane good, the woolen coat, Smith speaks of the assistance and cooperation of many thousands. Again, in chapter two, he paints civilization as a metaphorically cooperative enterprise, requiring the assistance of great multitudes. He teaches how our efforts to honestly better our condition are knit together in the market economy into a cooperative system. And this teaching is enhanced throughout the book, especially or notably in his treatment of price and wage formation, arbitrage, speculation, and international trade. A parallel element that runs through Smith's treatment of the division of labor that's sometimes missed is Smith's moral egalitarianism. There's a famous part in the second chapter where Smith compares philosophers and street porters. He claims that uh, philosophers and street porters aren't actually different in kind, that their differences stem more from education than from nature. Perhaps he overplays his hand, but the main point is that differences between individuals are smaller than we imagine. As he makes this point, especially as he calls attention to the vanity of philosophers, Smith moves to place all of humankind, philosophers, workers, politicians, economists, on the same moral plane. In conjunction with his message about the division of labor, which teaches how in a market economy, we each unknowingly play a part in meeting the needs of others, his point about philosophers and street porters, his point about the woolen coat, can be taken as a warm affirmation of ordinary life, a sincere authorization of each person's efforts to better his or her condition within the rules of justice. Now that very message comes across in one of the last things that Smith wrote, which is a chapter in the sixth and final edition of the Theory of Moral Sentiments. The chapter is called Of Universal Benevolence. So in that chapter, Smith affirms that the wise and virtuous person ought to be concerned with serving the happiness of humankind. But he continues that we are for the most part unequipped to contribute to human happiness in the abstract. And our attempts to do so are often, not always, but often destructive. The good of the universe of human affairs, he writes, quote, is the business of God and not of man. To man, he continues, is allotted a much humbler department, but one much more suitable to the weakness of his powers, to the narrowness of his comprehension the care of his own happiness, that of his family, his friends, and his country. So as a wise person heeds the providential order through a study of our moral sentiments and the marvelous beneficial potentialities of markets, however, he may, Smith seems to say, understand himself as cooperating with God in serving the good of the whole of humankind as he diligently furthers the good of his small part.
The 20th century economist uh, Wilhelm Röpke wrote in his book, A Humane Economy, that in matters of social and economic policy, we need a very clear and firm idea of what is the rule and what the exception, what the sound norm and what the possibly tolerable deviation. Now, Hutchison, Hume, and Smith continue to provide us with valuable insights, I think, on certain policy issues. Some of their analysis is timeless, but more importantly, they provide us with a wide set of sensibilities that give us a very clear sense of how we ought to think about rules and exceptions in personal conduct and in public policy. They advance a presumption of freedom within the rules of property uh, and freedom within the rules of property presumptively serves the common good. They advance a presumption of the virtue of commercial enterprise and they help us reframe our self-perception as we seek to better our condition. They encourage us to diligence, to self-application, to the stewardship of our resources. As we now in the 21st century live on the other side of the great enrichment, which took off shortly after Smith's death in the early 19th century, we ought to affirm these presumptions and invoke the spirits of great thinkers of the past to advance them in the 21st century. So economics is, of course, not sufficient to determine the content of virtue, the content of moral theology. Descriptive economics does not and cannot possibly replace theological, ethical, and political discourse. The great Michael Novak said, economics is not the be all and the end all. It is an instrumental art, but what an instrument. And with this statement, at least three Scottish philosophers, I believe, would concur. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matson, for that illuminating uh, lecture. At this time, we have an opportunity for questions and answers. And so there will be a couple of microphones around the room. Please wait to ask your question until you have the microphone, because of course we're recording. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, you, you talked about um, Smith and, uh, sorry, uh, in Hume and Hutchison. And so uh, Hutchison talked about right reason. And you know, Hume, Hume, of course, famously said that Reason is not to be the slave of the passions. So, you know, um, were they were they talking about the same thing in different ways, or you know, are they are they in some respect uh, irreconcilable? On, on reason, in particular, yes, they have different ideas about reason. I think there's a few Hume passages which are often cited and almost never cited properly. I think that's one of those passages. Some people take that statement. <coughs> to indicate that Hume has no concepts of practical reason. People don't have practical thought out reasons for doing things. People are slaves of passions, which Hume thinks they are to some extent, but he doesn't think that that negates having a concept of practical reason. So reason for Hume navigates within the passions. Practical reason is about cultivating a certain set of passions and habits. So there are differences between Hume and Hutchison, but I think they're not as stark as, as you might think at first blush, at least from reading that passage. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. I'm interested in the notion of design and how it's used by these three thinkers. And then in William Paley, have you, I don't know if you've studied Paley yeah. as a successor to them. So in the dialogues uh, on natural religion of Hume, design is really the crucial concept, right? So. Do um, you have a view on whether design is used for the economy uh, among these th thinkers? And it, in Paley, it becomes significant. What, why would it become more salient in successors to these thinkers? Do you have a view on that? I think, I think it is quite salient in Smith and Hutchison. I don't think it's as salient in Hume for reasons that you've described. I mean, the dialogues is actually a great articulation of the argument from design. So Hume clearly thought about this. But I think it is, in fact, very, it's very prominent in Hutchison and in Smith as well. Some, like I mentioned, some people read The Wealth of Nations as a kind of exercise in Newtonian natural theology. So it very much is an exploration of the providential order. 
on, on some interpretations. And, and I, think that's, I think that's accurate. And so I think Paley is broadly a continuation of, uh, of this kind of mode of political economy. There was a break between natural theology and political economy, but that didn't happen until after Malthus. So design and providence was a central aspect of economics as it was studied really until after Malthus because of his population principle. And well, because at least according to so Paul Oslington is a scholar who's written quite a bit about this. And according to Paul Oslington, people began asking too much out of natural theology. And so natural theology was, was kind of abandoned as a mode of discourse and economists um, distanced themselves from it in the 19th century. But I, I think Smith is in a similar vein as Paley. I have a very simple question. It's fascinating that you are bringing the spirit of Novakian theology into economics. He talks always about this tripartite system. And I think that one of the things I'd like to ask, if you think that Adam Smith, the three gentlemen you mentioned, they would have problem with saying what Novak used to call enlightened self-interest because he said that one of the deficiencies of the smith was that we talk about the self-interest and he made a little bit of a correction saying that we need to look at the life and interaction as a enlightened self-interest how would you address so, that? so the question is whether or not these thinkers had a concept of enlightened self-interest yeah yeah absolutely absolutely they did there none of them believed that things we always identify as our interests are in fact in our interests. If you read the theory of moral sentiments, it's, it's filled with passages on self-deception, <coughs> passions that hijack our decision-making systems, and passages about how we ought to make decisions after cool reflection. So it's, it's essential in, in, their, in their thinking, actually. Thank you, Art. That was great. Thank I you. appreciate it very much. Um, one of the comments you made was that in the thought of these three thinkers, philosophy descended from the clouds to the coffee house. Mm -hmm. And another was that economics displaced Christianity as the language in which or with which to discuss the common good. Um, and another point, you made the virtue that, or you made the comment that virtue relates to the good of humankind, the whole, the mm -hmm. happiness of all. Mm -hmm. this, 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 you seem to have condensed this. I, the question I've had while I was listening is, I was wondering, you know, if, as a result of this turn, it's obvious that economic wealth has grown exponentially. But I wonder if something emaciated has happened, like has happiness become a somewhat emaciated concept after this turn? And I'm, I'm wondering w what we lost um, in terms of a, a, an anthropology that, that really suits human beings yeah. by coming out of the clouds into the coffee house. Not to, not to denigrate sure. coming into the coffee house. Sure. Yeah, that, that comment, it really it comes, as I said, from Richard Steele and Joseph Addison. And there was an attitude in, in early 18th century Britain that philosophy was not of use to normal people, and there was a desire to make philosophy practical. In some sense, that's laudable. In some sense, well, philosophy is philosophy. Um, as far as the question about losing something, yeah, I, I, do think, I do think we've lost something. And I think these thinkers do give us a much richer anthropology than we get in most modern economics. And so there has been something that's lost from the 18th century. But it is in these, in these thinkers. So they, I, there's an interesting question whether or not their analysis contributed to a kind of loss of a richer view. But yeah, I'm not sure. But I agree with you. I agree with you that modern talk of happiness, modern views of the person that uh, economics has built upon are, are insufficient in a number of ways. Um, thank you very much. Um, Fascinating. And as you were speaking, I kept thinking about Stoicism. And apparently by the time he wrote Wealth of Nations, he had left the Christian faith and had become a Stoic in the reading groups around uh, the university with Adam Smith. And so I, I 
in the background, I'm wondering to myself, the, the narrative you've given makes all the sense in the world, but to what degree is it dependent upon um, the Calvinism and the Presbyterianism of, of the common people at the time? And if you go back to Calvin, as Thomas Aquinas looked to Aristotle, Calvin looked to the Stoics. And so there's a Stoic even through predestination, so where there's a, a stoicism that goes through Calvinism to Presbyterianism. And so to Michael's question about design, I can see how in Adam Smith's cosmology, if you will, or his, you know, if if he is stoic, if he is a stoic philosopher, the ends are given to the human person and the means are given as well. So in that sense, there's no need for prudence. There's no need for um, moral um, virtues in the in the Thomistic sense, in the in the medieval sense, right? Because the moral virtues give the end, and the prudence helps find the means. But if you're just following within the oversold, if you will, and you're doing your little part, you don't really have much choice, and you just do that. So I can see how those analogies of um, of the, the 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 nail in the you know in the large structure, how they all fit together. But I just I don't know. To what degree it's very dependent upon the ethical fiber of the people in Scotland at the time? Yeah, well, one thing I'll say is that Stoicism and Christianity melded together in 18th century Britain. There was a kind of Christian Stoicism that was part Christian, part Stoic, and so there was a cross-fertilization. Francis Hutcheson was kind of the poster child of Christian Stoicism, and he was the figure that a lot of the moderates, including Smith and Hume, sort of looked to. But Smith, Smith was not a Stoic. Smith was influenced by Stoic ideas in his youth, but in early and then especially in later editions of the theory of moral sentiments, he has some very harsh things to say about Stoicism, about Stoical apathy, about resignation. And Smith's system is open-ended, whether or not it's, it's consistent, if you, if you could find a consistent theology to apply to it. That, that's another issue that I haven't really thought so much about. But Smith believed that people make choices. Smith rejected stoical apathy and didn't think that we just resigned ourselves. He uses the language of cooperation, which is something that you also see in Anglicans, by the way, this notion of cooperating with the deity, people making choices whether or not to serve the common good or not. So the framework is there, the means are there, we have our senses, we make choices, we have the tools, it's our choice to use them properly or improperly. And so in that he departs from the Stoics quite significantly. Um, I think we have time for one more. Is this on? Okay. Um, you mentioned the common good. Um, do these thinkers have a common definition or understanding of the common good? I think, I think they broadly do have a similar concept of the common good. For all three thinkers, they believe that the good life involves the cultivation of virtue. When I say that in their thought, commerce serves the common good, what I mean is that commerce provides people with opportunities to pursue virtue, to build meaningful lives for themselves and their families. So that's really the sense in which I'm saying that commerce furthers the common good. There are senses in which commercial society detracts from the pursuit of virtue and they discuss those at length. But broadly, I do think they have a similar view of the common good. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Eric Cohn.